<clears throat> Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Inclusion and Economic Empowerment and Livelihoods Programming, Lessons from Lebanon and Around the World. My name is Laura Meisner and I'm a Senior Economic Recovery Advisor with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance through an agreement with the University of Arizona. BHA's mandate includes both immediate humanitarian response as well as helping communities recover from and be more resilient to crises. Inclusive development is a major priority of USAID. Inclusive development is the concept that every person, regardless of identity, is instrumental in the transformation of their own societies and that their inclusion throughout the development process leads to better outcomes. Inclusion is also a core part of BHA's humanitarian mandate, as we'll explore more in our first presentation. It's critical that we reach the most marginalized, specifically those who have been pushed aside or left out of the economic and political process due to their identities as older people or youth, persons with disabilities, women, members of the LGBTIQ plus community, Indigenous persons, refugees, members of specific ethnicities, castes, races, and more. BHA's Humanitarian Economic Recovery Assistance seeks to help people recover their livelihoods, start new livelihoods, engage in market systems, and be able to provide for their own needs. However, as we know, market systems are complex and often deeply inequitable. The rules both overt and unwritten, about who can participate in what roles in the market system and how much they're able to benefit can sharply hinder people's ability to succeed despite their tireless efforts and the best efforts of agencies trying to support them. There's a lot working against us in promoting inclusion in market systems. These include our own biases, assumptions, and knowledge gaps as humanitarian development staff and the relatively short program timelines for trying to change entrenched norms and power dynamics. There are some promising practices though, and we can build on these and do even better. I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers to share some of those lessons and practices. We have a great lineup for you today. First is my colleague, Ms. Karen Johannes. She's a gender, age, and social inclusion advisor here at DHA. Next, we have Ms. Eva Christensen, Senior Technical Advisor for Resilience at Chorus International, and Ms. Caroline Baderek, Acting Programs Director at Lutheran World Relief and Chorus International Lebanon. They will share with us some specific lessons learned in their work supporting women entrepreneurs, including refugees, in the Lebanon context. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A, so please share your comments in the chat box for the presenters. Unfortunately, participants can't ask questions using audio, so please put any questions or comments you have in the chat. With that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction and for setting the scene so clearly on what inclusion is and um, some initial thinking on why it matters so much for our programming. Um, as Laura said, my name is Karen Johannes, and I work at um, BHA's Office of Gender, Age, and Social Inclusion um, within the Office of Technical and Program Quality. For those of you that haven't worked with my team before, for your awareness, uh, we're a small team of dedicated advisors that work on promoting the inclusion of diverse groups in BHA-funded programs globally. And we also work to promote BHA's advocacy and policy at a global level, um, to advance social inclusion in the larger humanitarian system. And today I'm really excited to be here today with you all to share a bit about how BHA approaches social inclusion and why it matters for our programming. And then I'll end with some common challenges or gaps that we see um, in the space of social inclusion and in markets and livelihoods programming in emergencies. So to get us started, I'd like to drop a question in the chat and um, hear from you all. You all are the real experts um, on the call I know when it comes to livelihoods and markets pro your research researchers and scholars and thought leaders and practitioners on and I'd like to hear from you what are some of the barriers you have seen people with diverse trying to access markets pro I've dropped that 
that in the chat. Feel free to, to populate some answers in. So just thinking about the barriers and how many experience. So as Laura mentioned, um, at BHA we have a definition of social inclusion that we utilize. But in reality, um, inclusion kind of conceptually differs across organizations. But in general, when we talk about social inclusion, we're really talking about an effort to make sure that humanitarian action reaches those who most need it. And approaches to inclusion generally focus on ensuring equitable access to assistance. So this means being sensitive to the barriers that people face when trying to access support, making sure that support is responsive to their diverse needs, and recognizing their capacity to participate in and shape how aid is delivered. An inclusive approach also focuses on taking into account the patterns of marginalization that people may experience before and during crises. Inclusion requires us to think about how exclusion takes place and who does what to whom. The vulnerabilities that people experience during crisis do not just happen but rather they're the result of current and historical processes of marginalization. An inclusive approach is also rights-based. So this is aligned with humanitarian principles, including impartiality and accountability to affected populations. And at BHA, we believe that when we utilize an inclusive approach, humanitarian action can promote equity and the meaningful participation of marginalized groups and markets and across different sectoral programming. Uh, by integrating an inclusive approach in programming, um, this is really a cross-cutting requirement at BHA, and it's something that's solidified in our emergency application guidelines. So for those of you who have partnered with BHA before as an implementing partner, I'm sure you're very familiar with our emergency application guidelines. And I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight our gender, age, and social inclusion um, approach that is endorsed within those emergency application guidelines. And this, and this is really in two key areas. So first, the guidelines require that all implementing partners undertake a gender analysis. And gender analyses are an important tool for understanding the different roles that people with different identities play, how people with diverse identities are impacted differently by crisis, and the different needs and capacities that people have to respond or recover to crisis. BHA partners are then required to integrate findings of their gender analysis into program design, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. Gender analyses are an important tool for understanding um, and then designing programming in a way that promotes equity and accessibility for people with different identities. In addition to the gender analysis and gender integration requirement, response organizations that receive BHA funding must also identify specific programming considerations for reaching people with disabilities and people of different ages. In every technical sector, organizations must explain how they will ensure young people, older people, and persons with disabilities are engaged as stakeholders, decision makers, and beneficiaries of assistance in every step of the program cycle. They're also um, required to, to identify how they'll provide targeted assistance to meet the unique needs of these populations. This approach to social inclusion, endorsed by BHA, that of mainstreaming inclusion across every type of program and every activity, and then also providing targeted assistance, is what we call a twin track approach. And it's aligned with global best practices for inclusive humanitarian action. An example of inclusion mainstreaming and market activities could be designing and adapting livelihood related facilities to be safely and equitably accessed by diverse individuals. And an example of a targeted activity could be topping up cash-based transfers to persons with disabilities to cover additional costs persons with disabilities face when trying to access markets. And I see some great, um, some great um, sort of barriers being identified in the chat. Thanks for dropping those in. Um, I see Philip talked about the power imbalance or exploitation that people with diverse identities might face when trying to access markets or humanitarian action um, information. That's a huge challenge that many people with diverse identities face. How is information about services and markets programming um, being shared? 
who's able to access that information. And then transportation, that's another big, that's another big one that I'd like to talk a, a little bit more about as we turn to challenges and opportunities. Oh, thanks for that. Thanks for that um, point. I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Okay. So in the last few years, there's really been growing attention to the topic of social inclusion and markets and livelihoods programming, but translating this attention into action is still an uphill battle. Um, and so here are some common challenges and issues that I've identified um, as we prepared for this presentation. But when we move into the, the Q&A portion, I'd also love to hear from you some common challenges or opportunities that you've identified in your own work. So first, inclusion tends to be deprioritized at the start of humanitarian responses as organizations rush to scale up a response. Most humanitarian actors prioritize reaching the most people rather than reaching people most in need or providing the highest quality programming. When inclusion is not prioritized, it results in exclusion of marginalized groups and it reinforces historical inequities. Second, targeting is a staple of many markets programs, yet many humanitarian and market actors view identity groups as homogenous rather than recognizing the diversity and intersectionality of identities or how roles and responsibilities change because of crisis. Furthermore, there is often a perception that there is competition between identity groups and targeting. For example, if we fund targeted economic inclusion for women, we can't fund targeted programming for persons with disabilities. This is problematic for many reasons. It forces a false prioritization of different identity groups. It treats inclusion as a checkbox activity and it fails to recognize how experiences and crises are different based on multiple intersecting identities. Targeting people with marginalized identities for participation in programming also has mixed outcomes. Research shows it can lead to empowerment in some contexts and to further stigma or risks in others. Any method of targeting must thus be contextualized and requires paying attention to safe programming, which is also called protection mainstreaming including by analyzing power and protection risks and adapting programming to mitigate risks. Third, and similarly, a challenge many implementing partners face when conducting market activities is in how to identify persons with marginalized identities. This is particularly true when people with certain identities face stigma, discrimination, or even persecution, such as members of the LGBTQI plus community um, or persons with disabilities as um, different cultural definitions and understandings of, of disability are common. Many humanitarian actors will use government created lists of potential beneficiaries, but these lists can also exclude individuals or maybe based on criteria that is not aligned with the principle of non-discrimination. There are emerging good practices on how to address these challenges, such as by utilizing the Washington group questions for identification of persons with certain types of disabilities, or by partnering with trusted local organizations or self-help groups that are representative of the target population. Community-based approaches to, to identification show, promises in, show, show promise sorry, in many humanitarian contacts, contexts, such as involving the community. Um, for example, involving the community has been shown to more accurately identify people in need of targeted support, increase transparency, and reduce tension. A community-based approach is also aligned with inclusion. It is ultimately about building relationships with marginalized groups rather than relying on gatekeepers. Fourth, when we think about age inclusion and markets programming, we usually think about youth and middle-aged adults. There is very little markets programming that intentionally targets older adults, and this would be adults over the age of 60. This is really a missed opportunity to support older adults to access new and existing livelihood strategies and emergencies. And finally, many market-based programs understandably rely on markets. And Laura in her opening remarks talked about how markets are inherently unfair and are spaces of politics and power. This means many groups are marginalized from, particip from participation in these spaces and with the mechanisms many people use for engaging with them. For example, Many people with disabilities face institutional barriers, like overcoming administrative requirements for opening bank accounts, environmental barriers like distances to distribution points, or attitudinal barriers that even staff of good intentioned aid organizations can reinforce, 
like ableism or discrimination. There are trade-offs between all market-based interventions and modalities, but on the flip side, markets programming is uniquely placed to work towards promoting the systemic inclusion of people with marginalized identities. This is social change that can last well beyond the time span of a crisis. To do this effectively requires a thorough understanding of the barriers people with marginalized identities face in accessing markets and an analysis of their preferences on a way forward. This cannot be done without including people with marginalized identities in every aspect of program design and implementation. So I'm gonna end my remarks here and I've put below um, the contact information for the team that I sit on within BHA. This is bha.tpq.jazzy at usa.gov. We're always really happy to partner with and learn from and exchange information from um, people who are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis of promoting social inclusion. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And now I'd like to pass it over to Eva to continue us on our learning journey today. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I hope everyone can hear me well. I had some technical difficulties this morning, <laughs> um, but thank you so much for that. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation afterwards um, because certainly we'd like to touch on some of those points as well. Um, as Laura shared, I'm Eva Christensen. I am the Senior Technical Advisor for Resilience at Chorus International. I'm going to get us started and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Caroline who is our acting program director for both of the projects you'll see here. So we'll get us started uh, by talking about economic empowerment programming that we have done in Lebanon. These are the two projects we put together. They are tangent. Um, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties again. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, and so these are the two projects that we'll be speaking about. This is um, one of the WDDP projects, as well as a smaller project that we got um, to set up tangent to the first one. Eva, this is Jenny. We're not seeing you advance the slides. If you would I like, I can, yeah. I can advance them on your queue if you would like me to. That would be helpful, thanks. Mine's not sure. working. <laughs> thanks. So next slide, please. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so first I wanna set the stage a little bit um, to explain why it was important to us to start these projects in the first place. Many of you are aware of the context in Lebanon, there has been um, repeat and compounded crises since 2019. Um, first and foremost, of course, government corruption, uh, post-war debt accumulated that is now in excess of 150% of their GDP. There are financial engineering um, issues with the current governor of the Bank of Lebanon who created one of the worst economic depressions in history. He is now currently up for charges of embezzlement and money laundering. Um, but those practices have caused huge ripple effects throughout the economy. Of course, in 2020, we all remember that there was the explosion at the port of Beirut as well. Um, not only did that shut down trade for, for quite a while, but it did tremendous damage to the city and the, the neighboring region. Um, houses that were destroyed, businesses that were destroyed were not necessarily rebuilt. Um, I learned from a lot of my colleagues that insurance did not cover rebuilding those houses uh, because it was considered a, an act majeure, force majeure. Um, the Lebanese pound is rapidly devalued. Uh, the World Bank estimates that about three quarters of the Lebanese have been plunged into poverty at this point. And remember that Lebanon has been for quite some time now a middle income country. So this is new um, and this is not, not a good uh, scene. Uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you. And so um, further demonstrating the economic collapse it's the fact that they have multiple exchange rates simultaneously. And, you know, this really reduces the purchasing power of the people. Um, only the government determines who gets what rates, who gets the higher rates versus the lower rates, but the average person gets the banking rates. And these are the most recent from last week. Um, and you can see there's an enormous, enormous stretch between, a, uh, between the different rates. And so, you can see that now more than ever, it has been imperative to bring women into the workforce to help them um, support their families and uh, certainly their communities and to um, just try to survive this crisis as things hopefully get better in the future. So now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Caroline, who will go into the details of both projects um, and we'll talk a little more about this later. Caroline? Thank you so much, Eva and, and colleagues. Um, just allow me. Great. So thank you, Eva and colleagues. So in response to the current economic losses experience in Lebanon and it's deteriorating by, by, by the hour, as Eva mentioned, the, the, the many exchange rates uh, that we are experiencing. The team is in Lebanon is working to improve women's participation using two concurrent projects. The first one is the Women Global Development and Prosperity Initiative for expanding Women Labor Force in Lebanon, which we call the WGDP EWLFL program, um, funded by USAID and implemented by Lutheran World Relief, a chorus international member in Lebanon, uh, where women program participants underwent initial enterprise assessments to determine baseline and individual needs. They completed hard and soft skills training in a, in a digitized accredited business entrepreneurship certificate program, custom developed with the Lebanese American University LAU in Lebanon and several local private sector entities. They also engaged in one on one mentorship support sessions with successful businesswomen, networked in peer to peer groups and participated in direct networking and solidarity events and also began social media campaigns and online web directories and ultimately graduated from the WGDP program. Targeted skills and sectors align with national strategy, consider current economic, uh, current economic Lebanese context and even support women to enter non-traditional enterprises such as home repairs and IT in addition to traditional businesses. With the WGDP, we uh, implemented methods that specifically focused on empowering women entrepreneurs through leadership training and building skills to be able to influence decisions made in their community. And this project uh, is working collaboratively with other USAID uh, funded programs in Lebanon and local projects. So the second project is, um, I, I think I'm also having technical difficulties and, and Laura, I'd really appreciate if you can move on the slides because I think there, there is. Yeah, our slides aren't showing yeah. correctly. So yes, exactly. Jenny, if you could take those back for us. Absolutely. Thank you Thank so you. much. Is this the correct slide that you would like? Uh, no. Uh, well, this is the right slide, but it's not showing correct. Correctly. Yeah. It's missing half of the content. Oh, okay. It could be that there was animations and they're not showing up. No, there are no. Yeah, animations. that's fine. So, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Caroline. So, that's fine. I, I was going to talk about the second project, uh, which is the Lebanon Longer Term More Sustainable Livelihood Recovery Program, which is funded by Kirk in Axie, where through additional collaboration, the team in Lebanon works with Kirk in Axie and local microfinance institutions to build further capacity and provide businesses 
and access uh, to finance. The same women program participants from the first project, the WGDP project, continue capacity and strengthening by mapping future business goals and determining costs to attain them. Uh, also creating loan management plans and applying for loans and grants that are provided by Caribbean Axi and did this by Ground Up Investing, GOI, which is another course international member. In later program phases, conditional grants will be given to accelerate gold attainment and to improve uh, the enabling environment, the, the project will also include social cohesion in the interventions to build bonds between community and local businesses and create safe working environments for women. Between the two projects, the women program participants will become fully trained and mentored and their enterprises will be reassessed for progress. Then these women program participants will be provided access to either loan or grants or a mixture between a loan and a grant, which is a complete pathway for enterprise development and operation designs for longer term impact and sustainability. Uh, worth mentioning that the loans will be uh, the loans that are paid back will be reinvested in additional uh, medium and small business loans. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are here are some of, of the women program participants uh, on the left side: a coffee presser and seller uh, and her staff. And on the right side is a maker of a face and body soap and lotions. Uh, on the left side, Iman Musri, which is a program, a woman program participant who is in the field of coffee producing and retail and owner of a coffee factory along with her employees. And uh, on the right side, it's uh, Cynthia Brady, also a woman program participant, owner of an enterprise that specializes in creating handcraft soaps and body care products that can customize upon uh, the client's preferences. Next slide, please. Here again, uh, also another enterprise uh, owner and, and employee making and selling uh, traditional foods. Uh, Amal Al Halabi, owner of Sifret Amal, uh, preparing traditional, as you can see, traditional Lebanese cuisine dishes with her employee. Um, this enterprise is specialized in catering for special events and say, is, uh, selling uh, frozen foods. Next slide, please. So here we can see one of the social cohesion events where participants. Uh, are discussing issues and building solidarity. Uh, it's worth mentioning that country official, uh, officials, enterprise employees and families, local organizations and community members have attended the social cohesion events and also participated in the awareness sessions on social, uh, on sexual gender-based violence awareness sessions and also sessions on fair and safe uh, working condition, conditions in, in Lebanon. Next, please. So to, to facilitate the collaboration between the many partners and to ensure unbiased decision making in grants and loans, we created these two committees. Uh, the first one is the steering committee, where it's, uh, it, it is a platform where all the implementing partners discuss program strategy, uh, business models, the progress of activities and other program related uh, matters. And as I mentioned, it's, it's composed of all the, the, the IPs in the program. The second committee is the investment committee where we discuss and approve uh, loans and grants and uh, uh, details such as uh, the amount, the ticket size, the, the payback schedule and many more. Um, the, the loan portfolio management agency participate in uh, the investment committee meetings, but not in decision making. However, enterprises must receive positive assessment from uh, the loan portfolio management agency to be referred to the investment committee. Next, please. And here are some quick view of the demographics of, of our women program participants initially participating initially in the WGTP project and moving on to the KIA, the Kirk in Axie portion. 
just to demonstrate the diversity of, of participants. Most of uh, our women program participants are married and fall in the 39 to 59 year uh, old range. And we're glad to announce that we were able to enroll more than 10% of uh, young uh, Lebanese women entrepreneurs within our program. Next, please. So, as you can see, the project targeted women of all uh, education levels and particularly assess their ICT uh, capacity uh, for use towards social media, uh, online courses, and uh, many more. And although many have gone through some type of educational level, it was found that most of them lack uh, uh, digital media literacy uh, um, and skills as shown in, in, in the graph on the right. Uh, this was uh, not directly due to their age, but was a mixture between uh, the enabling environment and their previous educational background. Next, please. So here you can here it's an overview of, of the business uh, sectors uh, uh, participants our women program participants are engaged in most are in the food and beverage uh, sector and service sector almost sixty percent uh, the hybrid sector just means that they were they are working in more than one sector at a time and it's worth noting that the WGDP and the KIA projects are both no sector no region. Specific. Over to you, Eva. Thank you, Caroline. Yes, and and thank you, Jenny. <laughs> um, and so, as Caroline was saying, we delivered, we we designed the project to very deliberately include um, women and. Obviously, this this is a woman's project, but it wasn't as simple as just saying, you know, um, this is just for women. So we had to identify what the barriers were specifically for women. And I saw in the chat just a little while ago, we'll get to the questions, but um, it's not that women were not in the workforce to begin with, but they're not widely represented and they do tend to get squeezed out when times are economically difficult, favoring men for positions. Um, and there aren't equal rights. There were very low um, rates of loans for women. Uh, I think it was like 3%. Was that it, Caroline? Um, uh, it was very, very low percentage of of loans going to women to start businesses. And now, of course, there are no loans at all. Um, so this, these projects are about the only source of financial support that they can get at this time. Um, so, you know, part of the, the deliberate design is that they created this certificate program specifically designed in response to that initial assessment that Caroline was talking about earlier in the WGDP project. So they, they began by assessing existing enterprises, assessing their skills, assessing their education levels, and then cooperatively with the American University of Lebanon, they created this accredited um, online certification program. Um, so this was a, a really this is really a flagship of the project and it remains online currently to go forward into um, other iterations of this project, hopefully. Um, the learning sessions online, of course, helped uh, enable participation and enabled women to work around work and other commitments, even if they had other jobs or if they had family commitments. Um, so that was very important. Um, the online lessons are produced both in audio and visual um, so that if participants didn't have access to one or the other, or if there were some physical challenges, it could accommodate both. The mentorship was also uh, provided online and there were multiple sessions. Um, so they did these online um, so that when COVID was at its peak, that didn't prevent the project from going forward. It also didn't prevent women who had limited mobility um, for any reason to access the, the mentorship sessions. 
And then of course the peer-to-peer -peer support groups um, ha also had online sessions. As you saw, um, they had live in-person sessions as well for um, community building and for building the, the um, social capital of the group and the support between each other. So, um, but these options were also available online. Next slide, please. Thanks. And so we'll get to the part here where we want to talk about some of um, the things that have been great about the project, some that have been a little challenging, and then things that have really been challenging. And when BHA requested us to do this presentation, they said, tell us about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, of course, is that this accredited digitized certificate program was created with a university. So this is actually a university accredited program. Um, the one-to-one -one mentorship sessions, there were multiple sessions, not just one or two. And it was done throughout certain phases of the project um, so that the mentors could help propel the participants along the path in their capacity building and learning. The context and the deliverable flexibility really helped gain participation because otherwise, um, you know, some women don't have automobiles, they don't have access to taxis, the public transit system um, in the region is, is limited at best where it is available. So being able to connect these women despite mobility limitations was really important. And these were three great successes. So we'll say the bad, but really it's just less good, nothing really bad. Um, the timing of the mentorship sessions really affects the outcomes. And while we did have them um, sort of spread throughout the earlier phases of their online learning, we realized as the project went on that some later mentorship sessions would have been very helpful as well. Um, late towards graduation and even after graduation would be really helpful to the women. Um, we included six mentorship sessions, but participants are saying, give us more. Um, so that's a great lesson learned. Um, the more sessions we can do, the better. Here's a big one is that we learned that financial absorption capacity. Originally, we were trying to give away a lot of money to people who are making only an average of $14 a day. Um, and the absorption capacity, as many of you probably know from other projects, was very limited. And so we needed to pivot. We needed to learn that lesson on the spot, adapt the programming, and pivot to adjust to the level of economic absorption that we could attain with the micro and small enterprises. And finally, despite deliberate inclusion um, efforts, not just for women, obviously, but for anyone with disabilities um, of any sort, we did not get any applications for women with disabilities. And so we're looking at some of the questions that Karen mentioned earlier about targeting, identifying, being able to directly contact women living with disabilities for inclusion, perhaps on a next round. And so we'll get on to the final part here, which we'll call the ugly, which as you saw the context in Lebanon, um, particularly Beirut because of the explosion and the, the lingering effects of that. But in Lebanon, the situation is not good and the currency is continuing to devalue. Um, the economic situation is continuing to get worse. And so these women are at the start of their businesses or at their um, start of growth phases. And so the big question still remains how to best deal with the rapidly devaluing currency when trying to start or grow an enterprise. The flip side of that is that it gives us um, the opportunity to evaluate frequently, um, to learn as we go and hopefully find innovative solutions. It's gone well so far, but this remains a challenge. So, um, and now I'll turn over back to Caroline for the last slide. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you so much, Eva. And here is one final photo of uh, solidarity, gender equality, and women empowerment, social cohesion events at the Bekaa region in Lebanon, where we are all together demonstrating that we can achieve 
a gender uh, equal society and that a woman can break the gender barriers in, in Lebanon and become who and what she wants and by showing her community that there is no limit to what a woman can accomplish. Um, every woman's success should be an inspiration to another woman. And I believe that we are the strongest when we cheer and support each other on. Thank you all so much. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Caroline. What a nice message. And done. Um, so now we have a good amount of time for questions. Um, we already have some great questions in our chat box, so please keep adding those, whether for Karen and myself or for Caroline and Eva. Um, a few questions maybe to start you off, Caroline and Eva. Um, there was one question about how um, a lot of these small businesses, such as coffee, um, or higher end body products um, seem to target kind of middle and higher income people. Um, is that accurate? And how did the market research um, select what kinds of businesses to target? Um, I, I think I can jump in, but please, Caroline, by all means. Um add to what I'm saying, we, we didn't actually, um, we didn't do a study of businesses to identify which ones to work with. We identified the women interested in doing business or already operating enterprises and targeted them with whatever businesses they brought to the table um, or whatever interests they brought to the table. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't top down as it was you know, community to us, and then we supported them. Caroline, did you want to add to that, perhaps? So, yes, uh, thank you, Eva. It's, it's worth mentioning that uh, the project, uh, the WGDP project, was built and linked to previous US aid uh, uh, development programs in the private sectors in, in, in Lebanon, and that we uh, also uh, conducted a gender analysis to for uh, to, to identify and understand uh, the constraints and challenges uh, uh, that the women entrepreneurs are facing in in, in Lebanon uh, through an analysis of structural national uh, elements ranging from socio-economic, uh, legal, financial, uh, and the financial side. Uh, and it's also, as I mentioned, the WGDP and the KIA project are a no business uh, sector specific. So we have women program participants from multiple uh, business sectors. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question is about the online lessons. Um, so, first of all, making sure that um, Obviously, in order to get online lessons, you need to have reliable internet and a computer or phone was a, a challenge and was there a component to help anybody. Um, and then I'm also curious, um, you know, as we all learned during COVID, um, some folks are naturally very comfortable with online learning and some folks really need support to get there. Um, I'll fully confess, y'all still had to remind me to get off mute this morning in our uh, prep session. So, um, were there any challenges around that in terms of being inclusive and making sure that the online learning was fully accessible? Thank you, Laura. I'll, I'll take this one and Eva, please feel free to, 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 to jump in uh, as well. So, uh, most of the women program participants didn't have uh, access to formal uh, certification or or, uh, or accredited certification previously. So. Uh, we uh, did provide them with a laptop so they can access the digitized online courses that were uh, uploaded into a Moodle learning uh, platform so they can take it at their own pace, uh, uh, respecting the, their home care responsibilities. And we also provided them with uh, uh, internet uh, allowance uh, uh, and also digital media literacy skills uh, that can help them and enable them to use uh, uh, the laptops. Uh, some uh, that, because many of these women, as, as mentioned, they have low 
they were at least to have low ICT skills. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Karen, maybe some of these could be for you as well. Um, there were some questions. So uh, we heard Eva and Caroline say that despite deliberately trying to reach out to women with disabilities, that nobody who signed up for the program had a disability or maybe more accurately, nobody identified as having a disability. Um, there are some comments in the chat box, including, you know, there could be mobility issues, neurological disabilities, um, mental health, and that people might not even identify them, as well as that some are, you know, there's often still a stigma or cultural perceptions, and so they might still be hidden. Um, Karen, maybe I'll pass it to you first. Can you talk a little bit um, broadly or examples from other countries about how we might want to make sure that we're being highly inclusive while obviously not further stigmatizing anyone? Uh, thanks for this and, and for the considerations that were already named in the chat about um, differences in disability and sort of the difference between disabilities that are apparent or visible and those that are not apparent or invisible. Um, we, in the disability inclusion community, we've seen a lot of strides in the last decade or so when it comes to disability inclusive humanitarian action. But a lot of the thinking on that is still focused on physical disabilities or those disabilities that we can see and how we expand inclusion to also be inclusive of people that have um, neurodiversity, psychosocial disabilities, um, and other sort of disabilities that are not as parent isn't as, um, isn't as far along. So I really appreciate that people on this call are already thinking about that um, because that sort of awareness is a huge step towards taking action. In sort of our experience at BHA, um, one of the, there's different tools and different approaches that we can take. Um, we really recommend the use of the IASC guidelines for disability inclusion and humanitarian action. And that's a link I can drop in the chat. Um, the, the guidelines go into a lot more detail about the twin track approach that I mentioned. So mainstreaming disability inclusion, and then also providing targeted assistance. We know that about 15% of the world's population lives with a disability, and this number can increase during and after crises because of violence, um, you know, natural disasters, lack of availability of, of health care or health services, et cetera. And so it's really important that when we plan programming, we're making sure that accessibility is mainstreamed and that um, we're making considerations that at least um, are based on that estimate of at least 15% And when it comes to targeting people with disabilities, um, some of those challenges were named in the chat, the stigma, discrimination, sort of maybe the lack of engagement in public make it harder to identify this population. One really great tool for this is the Washington group questions that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a great tool if you already have sort of a target population where you're maybe doing surveys or door-to-door -door work or focus group discussions, and you can ask people questions that are about health that don't name disability. And so this really kind of breaks through that stigma of asking people to self-identify as having a disability. Um, that's a great way for identifying people with certain kinds of disability. Um, and it's not a way of diagnosing, but making that initial identification for use in program design or targeting. Another really great approach um, that I mentioned earlier is, is working in partnership with um, organizations of people with disabilities. At a global level, there are some you know, great networks that are doing this work, including the, the reference group, the, the disability reference group that's focused on implementation of the IASC guidelines. And one of their co-chairs is the International Disability Alliance, which is comprised of over a thousand organizations of people with disabilities. So if you don't know where to go in the country you're working in uh, to reach to find these organizations, you can always start at that global level. Ask, hey, what's your network in this country? Could you make maybe make a connection um, to a local organization of people with disabilities? And that can be an entry point. Um, and then it's really important. And I'll end here. <laughs> I could talk about this all day, um, but I think it's important to recognize um, what was I think Mary Dean put it in the chat related to. 
um, power dynamics between men and women, and, and just being mindful that uh, there are barriers, real attitudinal and social barriers that women with disabilities face in coming forward in a lot of the countries where we work. So also focusing not just on making that identification, but in also addressing that enabling environment and those social and attitudinal barriers to create um, an environment that's safe um, and accessible for women with disabilities to come forward and identify themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. That's such a great um, advice. And maybe someday we'll have the Karen Johannes Disability Inclusion Hour. I think we probably could fill that whole thing up. Um, Eva and Carolyn, is there anything more that you wanted to add on that? Sure. We uh, we actually, as you said, Karen, we we did um, survey for for self inclusion, sort of anonymity at the at the start to make sure that if if anybody needed to claim lack of mobility or or um, anything that would prohibit them from accessing physically accessing or using the training that had been assembled that we could identify and you're right I, I think that a different approach going forward will will be the key um, we we actually have an application in right now for an additional grant to do this program for women specifically with disabilities um, not to isolate them, of course, but to take some of the advice, the considerations that we're discussing here today, um, and very, very specifically target women living with disabilities in Lebanon to do a pilot project. So maybe next year we'll come back with the results from that and um, test out some of these you know, various options for inclusion test out some of um, our own options for the project and what worked really well um, and be able to put those two things together and and better economically empower the women with disabilities. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment also about the previous question um, about uh, having problems with online learning and the challenges there. And we had um, our senior project coordinator, Awan, was very, very dedicated and very helpful um, throughout the project and remains so. He has been online with them night and day, making sure that if anybody has issues um, accessing or understanding or moving through the project, he has helped them through. And so, um, you know, the answer for us was that we had someone highly committed to making sure that women could move, could access and move easily through the educational online portion of the group. So thank goodness we have a one. <laughs> Thanks. That sounds fantastic. Um, actually, related to that, um, a little bit on uh, disabilities and stigma and fear about coming forward. Um, I also wanted to know you included a reference in your program description about um, sort of a safe identification and then connecting to services for women who are survivors of gender-based violence. Um, and I wanted to know if you might be able to speak briefly just for a moment about um, how you created that safe space and again, made sure to do that without uh, further stigmatizing anyone. Sorry, was that for Karen? No, sorry, that's that's for you or Caroline. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, apologies. Um, yeah, I mean, this was this was more of a challenge. We we um, incorporated that into the social cohesion activities that were part of the Kia portion of the program because that was more specifically focused on. Um, social cohesion and then financial support in the end. The social cohesion aspects of it, there were community events, there were women to women events. Um, there was a lot of talk about um, community supporting the women in their enterprises and how the women will support community in their enterprises and really building the cohesion to get beyond labels and stigmas and to to build a, a greater acceptance and inclusion. Um, so this was the approach that we took. And Car Caroline, if you want to build on that at all, please do. Um, but I felt like the social cohesion aspects have been very strong in this program. 
Caroline, um, oh, uh, maybe before you answer, I'll also just include one last question that got um, uh, double requested, um, which maybe Caroline, you could speak to in this, which was how were men engaged in the project? Um, you know, were husbands or fathers of the participants? Did they have any control over women's access to the project and how were those power dynamics navigated? I know we only have about two minutes left and there's always more questions than time, um, but maybe if you could briefly address that. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'll try to be a quick answer possible and I'm happy to respond to all the questions later on, uh, maybe in, in, in browsing once we receive uh, them all compiled. So uh, I'd like to, to, to emphasize how the social cohesion uh, event and the awareness sessions on sexual and gender-based violence was out of benefit to all these women uh, uh, program participants, um, as many of these women uh, really needed a reform pathway, and we had a case where the, uh, uh, we were able to refer to one of our implementing partners uh, uh, specialized in in, 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 psychosocial, in the psychosocial sector. Now, speaking about uh, the inclusion of men, yes, uh, the the husbands of the women program participants, their employees, their communities were all invited to participate uh, in the social cohesion events and benefit out of all uh, the components uh, that was provided in, in these social cohesion events, including the awareness sessions, uh, the SWOT analysis that the women program participants did along with, well, with their communities to, uh, to identify the strengths and weaknesses within their enterprises and within their communities. Um, I know that was so, so, so quick. I hope I respected the time, uh, but as I said, I'm, I'm so happy to respond uh, uh, more into details because this is a very important aspect and a very important question as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I am and a huge thanks to you and to Eva and to Karen, as well as to all of our um, attendees today. Thank you for asking questions and engaging with this really important topic. Um, I have a feeling we could probably keep going here for <laughs> some more time, asking quite a lot of digging into the challenges and how we can get even better at this. Um, but I really want to thank everyone for engaging with this. Um, the recording as well as other materials will be available on marketlinks.org um, shortly after the conclusion. So please feel free to share this with any colleagues who were not able to attend. Um, and again, just many thanks to everyone. Uh, it isn't easy, but I believe that by continuing to work hard at this, we can get better at helping people access the economic autonomy and opportunities that they so richly deserve. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.